Hello everyone. This presentation will be on breastfeeding. It's an important topic both for the general public uh, with regard to awareness and at the same time towards medical students as a part of their curriculum. The slides which I'll be presenting from are made by the Indian Academy of Pediatricians and is available as a part of the 2015 IAP UG teaching modules. Uh, I thank the IAP for making these slides available uh, so I can uh, readily go ahead with this talk as such. And before going into the presentation in detail, I would like to highlight two key points with which I'll start the presentation as an introduction. The first point is that breastfeeding is the best gift what a mother can give a baby and breast milk is best for the baby in all regards. And the second point with which I want to begin the presentation by highlighting is six months of exclusive breastfeeding is a must for all babies. So uh, the first one, like I said, breastfeeding is the best. And six months of exclusive breastfeeding is a must for all babies. With these two key points, I move on to the presentation. We all know that breastfeeding fosters a physical and emotional bonding contact between both the mother and the baby. And it is a means of protecting, promoting and supporting the health of both the mother and the baby as a whole and as a unit. Exclusive breastfeeding for six months has shown that under five mortality and infant mortality rates both can be curtailed dramatically. And uh, with these key points, we'll uh, further go a little more in detail about the anatomy of the breast. Now, anatomically, each mammary gland forms a lobe of the breast which contains a single major branch of alveoli and milk ducts with one lactiferous sinus, each of which which opens into the nipple. The alveoli cells are what secrete the milk and these are surrounded by myoepithelial cells which cause contraction of the alveoli and are stimulated by the oxytocin release during the letdown reflex. As a combination of all of this, the milk comes into the ductule subsequently into the ducts. As you can see in this diagram, I'll zoom in on the corresponding parts. Uh, from the nipple, we have the opening of the lactiferous ducts. Lactiferous sinuses open into the lactiferous duct here, as you can see. So they open inward. Further, if you do come inwards, uh, there are lactiferous ducts and alveoli cells. Apart from that, the contour of the breast is maintained by the adipose tissue and there is also an underlying uh, pectoralis muscle upon which the uh, breast will sit and lie. Uh, if you consider the gross anatomy as such, the areola is the darker pigmented area. The significance of it is important when it comes to good attachment and feeding, which we will come to. And the flow of the milk comes from the lactiferous sinuses outward through the lactiferous duct through the nipple and such that the baby can suck. Now, I'll highlight a few myths which is commonly prevalent in society which has to be dispelled from an awareness perspective. Firstly, it is believed that women do not produce enough milk and that is flat out wrong. Uh, most normal women are able to produce sufficient milk for their baby. Secondly, the myth is that there is not enough milk during the first three to four days after birth, which is also wrong because uh, though the secretions might be less, whatever secretions are available is more than sufficient for a uh, baby to breastfeed. Thirdly, it is believed that a uh, baby should be on the breast for 20 minutes on each side, which is false. At a time, uh, complete feeding is to be given from one breast at a time. Fourthly, it's believed that uh, breastfeeding babies require extra water in hot weather in summer or in hot climate, which is also false because whatever uh, breast milk is there has enough components to quench the thirst of the baby and to attribute towards the nutrition aspect also. Another myth is it's easier to bottle feed than breastfeed and that is also not true. Now it might be more convenient at times. It is definitely not easier and has its own disadvantages. Uh, coming to whether the baby having diarrhea or vomiting, it's believed uh, at times wrongly believed that a mother should stop breastfeeding and that is absolutely wrong. In fact, in such circumstances, it's better to continue exclusive breastfeeding. Uh, certain beliefs are also there that uh, women who have undergone breast reduction surgery cannot breastfeed, which is also false. And that women with anatomically smaller breasts produce less milk compared to a larger breast. There is absolutely no correlation between size of the breast and milk production. Uh, it's also wrongly advised by many that a birth control pill should not be taken by breastfeeding women, which is false, because a birth control pill remains a good form of contraception, which is required in family planning. So that is again a wrong myth. And that women with inverted nipples cannot breastfeed is also false. So these 10 myths which I have listed out are commonly prevalent in society and must be dispelled because, like I said, a myth is just a myth.
it is absolutely wrong coming to the hormonal influences on breastfeeding we know that sorry uh, we know that uh, estrogen stimulates the ductule system to grow and uh, progesterone acts on increasing the size of the alveoli and the lobes prolactin acts during pregnancy and contributes towards the accelerated growth of the breast tissue and during lactation the alveolar cells make milk in response to the release of uh, prolactin when the baby sucks at the breast now oxytocin acts on the contraction of the smooth muscle layer uh, there are certain cells which are band like cells now these band like cells uh, help in squeezing of the milk into the duct system which is necessary to produce what is called the milk ejection reflex so if you consider grossly uh, these four hormones play a role initial stimulation by estrogen then progesterone subsequently which is taken over by prolactin and oxytocin if you see the order estrogen has the first role to play followed by progesterone subsequently prolactin and oxytocin but uh, to sustain and maintain lactation these two prolactin and oxytocin role is much important coming to initiation of breastfeeding as per the neonatal resuscitation protocol it is strongly advised to begin breastfeeding immediately at birth provided the baby cries and is normal however practically it might not be possible uh, but it is definitely a target which should be aimed in many centers but as per guidelines it is recommended that a baby initiates feed within half an hour of a normal delivery and one hour within a, a cesarean section but ideally as soon as a baby is born it is good to initiate breastfeeding the reason being when a baby is born a baby is biologically ready and initiation of breastfeeding is easier at that time later on the baby does go into a state of more prolonged sleep and hence initiation of breastfeeding is difficult now once initiated it is strongly advised to maintain the frequency at second hourly or on demand and exclusive breastfeeding for 6 months like i mentioned at the start of the presentation i am mentioning it again 6 months of exclusive breastfeeding is a must and the time for each feed should be 15 to 20 minutes now when i say exclusive breastfeeding i mean that breastfeeding should be given for the first 6 months and there should be no prelactal feeds certain communities give uh, certain components such as honey sugar water donkey's milk cow's milk as prelactal feeds due to various customary reasons but it is medically bad for the baby no prelactal feeds should be given there should be no formal or formula feeds no use of pacifiers and no additional fluids now all of these criteria together comprise exclusive breastfeeding coming to the reflexes in the breastfeeding there are three reflexes which help in establishing breastfeeding normally one is a rooting reflex second is the swallowing and third is a suckling reflex if you see in the order rooting sucking and swallowing comes one after the other coming to the rooting reflex uh, when the baby is allowed to suck at the nipple and the nipple touches the cheek of the baby the baby opens the mouth this rooting reflex helps in establishing a good posture and helps in establishing breastfeeding coming to the suckling reflex it helps in drawing the milk out of the mammary gland and it comprises of three parts firstly the drawing in of the nipple and the areola to form an elongated teat within the mouth secondly pressing the stretched nipple against the palate and thirdly drawing the milk by peristaltic movement of the tongue underneath the areola and compressing them to the palate above thirdly the swallowing reflex it generally takes 2 to 3 suckles to fill the baby's mouth with milk and once a mouth is filled the baby swallows and then breathes this is because of a closed glottis so this cycle of generally sucking swallowing and breathing lasts for one second as a whole and 2 uh, to 3 suckles will fill the mouth of the baby with milk and the cycle will repeat again now this chart is important it uh, stimulates uh, it basically shows how sucking stimulates uh, breastfeeding it is basically a neuro endocrine reflex so there is a neuro endocrine component so uh, we'll come to that in a minute we'll assume that the baby is sucking on the breast right here so uh, because of the stimulation the tactile stimulation what is there over the nipple through the neural loop through the spinal cord the hypothalamus is activated and neural impulses go up to the hypothalamus from the hypothalamus there is a stimulus which comes to the posterior pituitary specifically the neurohypophysis through the nerve cells 
From here, we know that oxytocin is secreted in the posterior pituitary, that is in the neurohypophysis, through the capillaries, and oxytocin is released. When oxytocin is released into the bloodstream, it comes and acts upon the alveoli cells in the mammary gland, which help in the secretion of milk and ejection of milk through the myoepithelial cells, which results in ejection of milk to the baby. When the baby receives milk, the baby sucks for more milk, and as a result, the cycle continues once more. This is what we call as the neuroendocrine reflex. Now we can divide this into two components. One is the milk production reflex and there is a milk secretion reflex and the other is a milk ejection reflex. The milk production reflex is maintained by the action of prolactin and the milk ejection reflex is maintained by the role of oxytocin. So that is important to keep an eye on. Uh, with that we will come to the milk secretion reflex. Like I mentioned, sucking acts as an efferent impulse and these nerve stimulus carry the impulses forward which in turn increases prolactin. The prolactin is released into the bloodstream and induces cells of the alveoli to produce milk and distend it. And like I said, the more the baby sucks, greater is the milk production. As a result of which, the mother should be advised to breastfeed once in two hours or on demand. Reason being, the more the baby sucks, the more the milk will be produced. The more the milk is produced, the more there will be sufficiency of milk for the baby. Coming to the milk ejection reflex, uh, oxytocin is produced by the posterior pituitary gland as a stimulus to the nerve endings in the nipple by suckling as well as by thought, sight or sound of the baby. So uh, all of these are positive stimuli which help in the secretion and in the ejection of milk. We know that oxytocin is responsible for the contraction of the myoepithelial cells and milk is emptied from the alveoli into the lactiferous ducts. The reflex we know is affected by maternal emotions and a relaxed, confident uh, mother will help in having more milk. So what we can understand by this is ensuring that the mother is given a peaceful, calm environment will help in ensuring that there is adequate milk production. Now, if we see conversely, tension and stress to the mother will hinder the milk flow. So uh, there are factors which promote uh, milk secretion and factors which uh, mitigate and uh, suppress the milk production. These are those factors. Now, at a gross level, if we see how breast milk is produced, this is another diagram showing the neuroendocrine reflex. We know that there is a stimulus on the nipple and this stimulus goes up to the hypothalamus and from the hypothalamus comes through the posterior pituitary which acts on the lactiferous cells and results in the milk production. It is the same diagram which is shown once more. Another diagram which is shown, uh, shown schematically in this where uh, nipple receptors are activated this diagram is important uh, for a spotter in an entrance exam as well as at the same time in a theory paper to be drawn by the medical students. Now, uh, at a more day-to-day uh, -day level, there are factors which decrease milk production which include the use of dummies, pacifiers or bottles, giving pre-lacteal feeds such as sugar water, honey and other pre-lacteal feeds like kajur, date and uh, donkey's milk, cow's milk. Certain painful maternal conditions such as sore, cracked nipple or congested breast and a lack of night feeding which interferes with the prolactin production. Now, it is important to ensure that the mother continues to feed every two hours even at night because this will ensure that the continuous cycle of milk production is maintained. Uh, coming to the composition of breast milk, uh, breast milk itself is there in different stages. The first initial milk what is formed is the colostrum. Subsequently, it becomes transitional milk. From transitional milk, it forms mature milk and mature milk has different subcomponents of fore milk and hind milk, each of which I'll come to in detail. Colostrum is secreted in the initial few days after delivery. It is generally less in quantity and is thick yellow in color and contains a large amount of proteins, immunoglobulins and secretory IgA. It is not mentioned in the slide, I'll just add it here. Secretory IgA is present in more quantity in the initial colostrum and vitamin E, D, E and K is there but relatively vitamin D and vitamin K are not sufficient in breast milk. We will come to that in later slides but keep in mind it's in uh, sufficient quantity for vitamin A and vitamin E. Now transitional milk is secreted for three to four days after uh, birth up to two weeks. Transitional milk is rich in fat and sugar content for the baby. Moving on to mature milk, it is thinner and more watery in consistency and it contains all essential nutrients what is required for the baby's growth. 
Now, like I said, uh, mature milk has two components. Firstly, is a four milk, and secondly, is a hind milk. With any feed, uh, four milk is what comes first, hence the name. Subsequently, hind milk is what comes later. Four milk contains adequate amount of water, and it is more watery in nature and is rich in proteins, sugars, vitamins, water, and mineral. The key point is four milk is what helps in satisfying the baby's thirst. Now, hind milk is more rich in fat. It comes towards the second half of the feed and it provides more energy and is what gives a sense of satiety. Now, understanding this concept is why we advise the mother to feed for a full 20 minutes from one breast at a time and not uh, 10 minutes on one breast and 10 minutes on the other. If you feed only the initial part from each breast, you will get only the four milk which will satisfy the thirst but will not give satiety. The baby will cry and there will be a hindrance in giving uh, feed the next time. So it is always advised to feed at a time from one breast at a time and giving both the four milk and the hind milk and not one or the other. It is important to give both. Now uh, coming to the position of the baby during the feed, the entire baby should be supported not just the neck or the shoulders. The head, the body should be in one line without any twist in the neck. This is important because a twist in the neck increases the risk of aspiration. The baby's body should be turned towards the mother and the baby's nose should be at the level of the nipple. Now, these four are common positions which are uh, kept during a breastfeed. The first is the cradle position where the baby is supported from the same side as uh, being fed. Cross cradle position where the baby is supported from the opposite side. The football or clutch position and the side lying position. Now, it is not recommended that one position is better over the other. All four are equally effective but comparatively cradle and cross cradle are more better than side lying. It is always advised for the mother to sit up and give a feed because it is more comfortable for the mother in the long run. Uh, coming to signs of good attachment, uh, baby's chin close to the breast is a must. The tongue of the baby must be under the lactiferous sinuses and the nipple should be against the palate. The baby's mouth should be wide open and lip to be turned outward and more amount of the areola should be visible above the mouth of the baby than below it. These are all cardinal signs of good attachment, which shows that the baby is feeding well. Diagrammatically, if we see, uh, the first image shows the mouth covering the entire areola. The lips are flanked outwards, which shows a correct latch on position. And a uh, schematic diagram showing more in detail where the nipple is touching up to the palate and the tongue is ensuring the rhythmic contraction, which ensures adequate feed. Conversely, if we see the signs of poor attachment, uh, the baby is sucking only the nipple and not the areola and the mouth not being widely opened, the tongue not inside the mouth and not covering the breast tissue and chin being away from the breast. These are signs of poor attachment which require intervention. Now, uh, coming to the benefits of breast milk in detail, uh, we already discussed that breast milk is nutritionally superior. It contains all the nutrients which are required for normal growth and development and in optimum proportion and in a form which is easy, easily digestible and absorbed for the baby. If you see purely carbohydrates, lactose is present in maximum quantity that is 6 to 7 gram per deciliter and galactose is considered as absolutely necessary for brain development and for the growing infant. Lactose is also important in the calcium absorption which is ultimately needed for skeletal maturity and lactose helps in the growth of lactobacilli within the intestine. Breast milk is also rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are required for myelination and maturity of the central nervous system. They contain omega-3 long fatty acids and uh, DHA, that is docosahexanoic acid, is required for myelin, which helps in maturity of the fatty sheath around the nerve fibers. There are other lipids which are also present in trace quantities such as EPAs and prostaglandins. And these are also required for steroidogenesis and for absorption of fat soluble vitamins and phospholipids, all of which have an essential role in the body. Now, uh, if you consider the protein which is present in breast milk, 60% of it is whey protein and uh, the remaining 40% is casein and that is easily digestible. Lactalbumin is rich in tryptophan and is the precursor of serotonin. This is an important neurotransmitter and lactoferrin also helps in the absorption of iron and zinc and is also bacteriostatic also. If you consider the enzymes, uh, peroxidases, lipid lipases and uh, bile salt stimulated lipases kill uh, microbes, these act by hydrolysis of the bacterial lipids. 
Lactobacillus is an important probiotic which is required. Generally, it's a probiotic gut flora, which is a good bacteria in the gut. Now, because the baby does not take feeds externally and is purely dependent on breast milk, breast milk itself is a source of lactobacilli and lactic acid which help in digestion. These are the probiotic substances which are present in breast milk which ultimately help in a positive health of the baby. A probiotic also helps in synthesis of in endogenous vitamins such as vitamin K. Vitamin K is deficient in breast milk and is secreted purely by the gut flora as and when it develops and breast milk is required for the development of it. Now coming to the immunological aspects of it, uh, breast milk is safe, non-allergic. There is no documented cases where a baby is allergic to maternal breast milk. It contains immunoglobulins where there is secretory IgA which contain uh, plasma cells, polymorphs and other growth factors. Serum IgA provides surface protection to the respiratory and GI tract and help in the cellular aspects of T cells and B cells which help in cellular and humoral immunity. As we all know these T cells and B cells form the first line defense against external infections. So giving uh, breast milk will help in uh, adequate quantity of serum uh, IgA, secretory IgA which help in fighting and combating infections. Vitamins wise, uh, like I said, vitamin D and vitamin K both are deficient in breast milk, which is why vitamin D is supplemented as 400 international units per day to all babies for a duration of six months. Uh, by six months, weaning would be there. As far as vitamin K is concerned, uh, vitamin K is given one milligram at birth itself. This one milligram helps in preventing diseases such as hemorrhagic disease of newborn, which is a severe manifestation of vitamin K deficiency, which is life threatening. So one milligram of vitamin K given at birth through an injection route itself is more than sufficient to uh, ensure uh, uh, hemorrhagic disease of newborn is combated. Also, like I mentioned about uh, lactobacillus being formed, once the gut flora is formed well, the amount of vitamin K endogenously secreted is more than sufficient unless there is an external issue such as a congenital liver disease or a liver failure. Uh, minerals like iron zinc are present in small quantities and the bioavailability is generally better because of the carrier proteins and they are all of low osmolarity. Other benefits to the mother include involution of the uterus, uh, reducing the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. It helps in burning off the excessive fat accumulated during pregnancy and in the long term reduces the risk of ovarian and breast cancer to the mother. Lactational amenorrhea is a form of natural contraception uh, commonly known as NAM. This helps in delaying the next pregnancy though it is not effective it helps as an additional factor which helps in uh, giving a benefit to the mother in terms of natural contraception. Uh, while mentioning that I would like to mention lactational amenorrhea also has the highest rate of failure too but it still forms some benefit to the family. Now coming to other benefits to the family and society as a whole breastfeeding is more economical than artificial feeding. Breastfeeding helps in promoting family planning. It reduces the need for hospitalization of children and reduces infant mortality and morbidity. Now uh, this poster what you see here is uh, showing the advantages of breastfeeding to the family in the interest of promoting uh, breastfeeding and in initiating good breastfeeding practices to the community. Uh, many such posters are required in uh, antenatal units to give awareness and to ensure that antenatally itself the mother is sensitized towards the requirement for breastfeeding. Moving on to uh, a baby friendly hospital initiative, it was initially started by UNICEF in 1992. Uh, the initial idea behind this was to in, uh, promote breastfeeding as a whole and uh, to establish that exclusive demand feeding is the only mode of early feeding acceptable. BFHI was further expanded to BFHI plus which further uh, accounts for other aspects such as immunization and good antenatal care and uh, preventing mortality because of diarrheal diseases through oral rehydration therapy. Other institutes such as WABA, which is World Alliance for Breastfeeding Action, it's a global agency which helps in promoting breastfeeding as a whole. The headquarters of WABA is situated in Malaysia and it was established in 1991. It uh, basically aims at improving the awareness on breastfeeding worldwide and coordinates activities such as World Breastfeeding Week. World Breastfeeding Week is celebrated between the 1st and 7th of August every year annually throughout the world with the intention of spreading awareness and uh, curbing the challenges faced by mothers to enable breastfeeding. 
At a national level, uh, Breastfeeding Promotion Network of India, BPNI, is a national entity for breastfeeding which works in coordination with UNICEF, WABA and the World Health Organization. Now, uh, coming to the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, there are 10 key steps uh, which are established. I will go through all of them in detail. The first and foremost is a written breastfeeding policy that is routinely communicated to all healthcare staff. Secondly, all staff are to be trained to implement this policy from writing not just on paper to establish and uh, implement it in the field. Thirdly, all pregnant women to be sensitized to the benefits and management of breastfeeding antenatally itself and any doubts, apprehensions to be cleared as soon as possible. Fourthly, to help mothers initiate breastfeeding as early as possible, like I mentioned, uh, ideally immediately after the child is born and cries, uh, at least half an hour within a normal delivery or one hour within a cesarean section. And to show mothers how to breastfeed and to maintain lactation even should they be separated from their infants due to any medical or surgical cause. Ensuring exclusive breastfeeding and not giving the newborns any food or drink other than breast milk unless medically indicated. Practicing rooming in, allowing mothers and infants to remain together for 24 hours a day and encouraging breastfeeding on demand. No use of artificial teats or pacifiers uh, to soothe or calm the breastfeeding baby and to foster the establishment of breastfeeding support groups and uh, referring mothers to such groups on discharge from the hospital. Now, uh, coming to certain issues which are faced by the mother uh, while breastfeeding, it could be a flat or inverted nipple, it could be breast engorgement, it could be a sore cracked nipple, it could be a blocked duct, it could be mastitis, it could be a breast abscess or it could be inadequate milk secretion. We will come to each of these in detail. Coming to a flat nipple, uh, generally it gets corrected when the baby suckles and should the pro uh, problem persist, it's advised to go for the inverted syringe technique or the double syringe technique. Uh, step 1 is to cut the syringe uh, as shown in the diagram. So assuming we have cut the syringe and uh, inserting the piston of the syringe from the cut end. Then keeping the syringe over the nipple, uh, applying the smooth end of the breast and gently pulling the piston to ensure that the nipple comes outward and once it comes outward it uh, tends to get corrected. Antenatal screening and good breast examination antenatally itself by the obstetrician will go a long way in identifying this problem early and correcting it early as well. Secondly, coming to breast engorgement, uh, we know that breast milk production increases during the second and third day after delivery. If feeding is delayed or infrequent or not positioned well, milk tends to accumulate in the alveoli. If the milk production increases, the amount of milk production exceeding the storage capacity, it results in engorgement, which results in a swollen, hard, worn and painful breast as you can see in the image. The treatment for a breast engorgement is nothing but moist heat through warm water 3 to 5 times before each feed, gently massage stroking towards the breast, uh, towards the nipple, frequent feeds for 2 hours, at least 15 minutes per feed, feeding in a quiet, calm and relaxed place and giving paracetamol to the mother for pain relief. Coming to a sore nipple, it's generally because of incorrect attachment and if the baby doesn't get enough milk, the baby tends to suck more vigorously which results in nipple injury. A sore nipple which if the physical trauma continues results in a cracked nipple, mastitis or can even lead to a breast abscess. A cracked nipple can also be caused because of frequent washing with soap and water as a chemical injury of the soap. Pulling the baby off the nipple while sucking or oral thrush in the baby which develops after a few weeks. To treat this, it's important to correct the position and the attachment of the baby to the breast. Ensuring hind milk applied to the nipple after a feed is a very effective technique to combat a sore or a cracked nipple. It is also good in maintaining nipple health as a whole. The nipple should be air dried to allow healing and nipple to be washed once daily with only water. Now, if an infant has oral thrush, it could be because of an immunodeficiency in the baby. It could be because of an opportunistic infection. 1% gentian violet to be applied over the nipple as well as the baby's mouth. And if the mother is having a fungal breast infection, to be treated with fluconazole 250mg to be given 3 times a day for 10 days. If there is a blocked duct because of improper suckling over a particular segment and there is a painful heart swelling but not associated with fever and accumulated thick milk blocks a lactiferous duct, it will result in a blocked duct which is treated by uh, removal of milk at frequent intervals avoiding tight clothing and doing a gentle massage towards the nipple to ensure uh, that whatever milk is accumulated is expressed out. Coming to mastitis, it is because of persistent engorgement of the blocked duct and is because of supervening infection 
or mastitis if untreated can lead to a breast abscess. Clinically, on examination, the breast will be red, hot, tender and swollen, followed by high-grade fever which is present in abscess or raised blood counts which are also seen. Classically, what you see here is a red, hot, tender breast which is nothing but typical of mastitis, itis referring to inflammation, mastitis inflammation of the mammary gland. Treatment-wise, it is uh, initially you can go for supportive counselling, uh, reassuring about the value of breastfeeding and that it is safe to continue feeding despite mastitis present. Milk from the affected breast will not harm the baby and the contour, shape and function of the breast will return to normal with adequate treatment. Effective milk removal by proper attachment, encouraging frequent feeds and expressing milk by hand or by a breast pump, all of which are effective. Coming to antibiotic therapy, antibiotic therapy is definitely indicated if the bacterial counts and cell cultures are available, if there are severe symptoms from the beginning with a visible nipple fissure or no improvement after 12 to 14 hours of improved milk expression. If initiated antibiotic therapy is to go on for 10 to 14 days with symptomatic treatment for ibuprofen and paracetamol for pain relief to the baby, uh, mother. This is one of those conditions where ibuprofen does tend to have more advantage than paracetamol. Uh, personally, we do tend to use paracetamol more often and more commonly in practice, but ibuprofen is a better choice. The risk of ibuprofen as far as anaphylactic reactions is always there and it is up to the treating clinician to decide how he wants to go about it. But uh, purely in this indication, ibuprofen does work better unless proven otherwise. Now, as far as uh, antibiotic therapy is concerned, there have been many lectures and many talks about the rational use of antibiotics and preventing antibiotic resistance because of uh, excessive unjudicious use. However, mastitis and breast abscess, because it involves uh, feeding and uh, feeding compliance and ensuring comfort and symptomatic comfort of the mother, this is uh, one of those indications where early antibiotic therapy is good and uh, early antibiotic therapy will help in early cure which will help in ensuring that the confidence of the mother is established and breastfeeding can go on as usual. Coming to another condition such as inadequate milk secretion, it could be because of infrequent feeds, hurried feeds, poor suckling position, poor oxytocin reflex or breast engorgement or mastitis. The treatment for this is nothing but giving reassurance, giving more adequate feeds especially during the night time ensuring that attachment is proper, feeding in a calm environment in a relaxed position, treating the comorbid conditions such as a sore nipple and mastitis. Now, till now we were considering breastfeeding in normal circumstances, assuming that the mother is ill, and we also discussed about the common uh, difficulties which are faced by a breastfeeding mother. Moving forward, if we consider uh, the conditions of feeding in special circumstances, when I say special circumstances, uh, I mean certain conditions where uh, a legitimate question does arise whether feeding can go on or not. If the baby is ill, breast milk is undoubtedly the most digestible food for an ill baby and is also the best pacifier. Breast milk is also a life saviour to many babies and it satisfies nutritional as well as fluid demands both. Breast milk also has sufficient protective and immunological factors to help in combating any illness. So even if there are conditions such as rhinitis, a viral fever, diarrheal disorder or a respiratory infection, breast milk and breastfeeding is to be continued and must not be stopped. In the case of respiratory infections, if there is a risk of aspiration alone, where there is a specific indication that the baby must not take feeds orally, unless otherwise breastfeeding can be continued and is advised to continue. Uh, elaborating a bit more on that, Breastfeeding is to be discontinued only if there is a gastrointestinal contraindication to oral feeding. One classical example of this is necrotizing enterocolitis, where the baby is kept on TPN, total parental nutrition, and only in this condition, in the initial days, where uh, early feeding regimen is not advised. If the baby sucks with less vigor, offer more frequent feeds, it will tend to correct itself. If the baby cannot suck, offer express breast milk and genuinely, gradually, even in severe preterm, it will help in establishing breastfeeding. Babies with congenital, uh, congestive cardiac failure also do well with express breast milk because it contains less amount of sodium quantity than uh, fluids. So till now we considered baby conditions where breastfeeding is contraindicated. Moving on to if the mother is ill. Supposing the mother is having a viral fever, a urinary tract infection, breast abscess, TB, hepatitis B, or HIV AIDS also for that matter. I will include HIV into the list. 
supposing any of these conditions are there there are legitimate concerns whether breastfeeding can be continued or not i would like to allay that breastfeeding can be continued in almost all of these conditions if we consider tuberculosis uh, it is generally believed in the west to uh, contraindicate breastfeeding until 2 weeks of maternal chemotherapy but in india breastfeeding is not contraindicated now we know that recently the rntcp that is the revised national tuberculosis control program has now become ntep national tuberculosis elimination program due to the revision and as per the latest guidelines tb is uh, being treated as per daily dots so uh, under this daily dots regimen uh, if the mother is a known case of open tb she is started on chemotherapy and baby is put on chemo prophylaxis with inh that is isoniazid and rifampin but breastfeeding can be continued in an indian setup after 3 months uh, mother is tested once more to check whether uh, she is sputum negative and a mantu is done for the baby if mantu is negative to stop all drugs and give bcg and continue vaccination as per schedule if mantu positive continue chemo prophylaxis for another 6 to 9 months if you consider breastfeeding in hepatitis b we know that any baby born to hepatitis b positive mother is given immunoglobulin as well as vaccination both and there is should be no, absolutely no delay in initiation of uh, breastfeeding in such uh, babies we know that if we consider vertical transmission versus breastfeeding the risk of transmission of hepatitis b is much more in vertical transmission than in uh, breastfeeding so breastfeeding is safe in hepatitis b and for that matter in a special condition such as hepatitis c also breastfeeding can be given now if we consider hiv aids the perinatal transmission of uh, breastfeeding is 30% and the transmission through breastfeeding is merely 5% which is almost 6 times more vertical transmission than uh, breastfeeding for a hiv positive mother the recommendations are delivery by cesarean section artificial feeding as per afas criteria when i say afas criteria artificial feeding should be given if affordable feasible acceptable safe and sustainable for 6 months and drug therapy to be given for the mother and baby as per pptct guidelines pptct full form being prevention of parent to child transmission in the us breastfeeding is contraindicated in hiv however in other countries artificial feeding is given only if indicated as per the afas criteria otherwise uh, if specifically indicated alone you can go for artificial feed otherwise breastfeeding should be continued the key point which i would like to highlight is artificial feeding damages the mucosal barrier and breastfeeding uh, will lead to easy transmission of hiv virus through a damaged mucosa as a result of this mixed feeding is completely dangerous this is one key point which i would like to highlight as a take away message from this slide either you should go for an artificial feed or you should go for a breastfeed but never do both so it is always artificial feed or breastfeed but never both or never a mixture so in the initial stage itself that mother and family to be counseled if suitable go for artificial feed otherwise go for breastfeed but never do a mix and match regimen because it is absolutely detrimental to the child postpartum psychosis is an important challenge which is faced by many mothers breastfeeding is allowed under supervision the mother should get adequate psychiatric help and psychiatric counseling to ensure that she is brought back to mainstream and if no danger to the baby breastfeeding is allowed however i would like to mention here that if started on any antidepressants they are to be definitely checked whether it can be given uh, during lactation or not if not allowed due to the transmission from breast milk uh, through breast milk i'm sorry such as and atypical antipsychotics like clozapine or lansapine then you must switch to an uh, through an artificial feed regimen now uh, there are certain conditions where breastfeeding is absolutely contraindicated and there is no other go one such thing is congenital lactose intolerance second is galactosemia thirdly uh, maternal drug intake of anti cancer drugs anti thyroid drugs certain antipsychotics such as lithium which is given for bipolar disorder ergo derivatives iodinated uh, radio contrast and uh, hiv if uh, artificial feeding is contraindicated as per afas criteria now if we consider the options to working mothers 
it's advised to continue ex uh, exclusive breastfeeding as far as possible before resuming work and absence of uh, keeping the baby in daycare center at work and feeding in between the work hours uh, also advisable to switch the workplace to near the house or vice versa and of course a new trend what is uh, coming up nowadays work from home so work from home does go a long way in helping this apart from this expressing and keeping the express breast milk while the mother is away breastfeeding before leaving to work immediately after returning from work during nights and on holidays and extending maternity leave up to 4 to 6 months or availing half pay or loss of pay if financially feasible for the family now apart from this uh, recent headlines have shown that uh, the australian prime minister was the first one to feed in uh, parliament while in session and establishment of breastfeeding rooms in most government and public offices are good measures which go a long way in ensuring breastfeeding mothers can continue to feed now if we consider expression and storage of milk express milk is the way of uh, mainstay of feeding rather in preterm low birth weight babies and sick babies and uh, if you consider working mothers also it's a important form uh, illness hospitalization of the mother or the baby uh, precluding breastfeeding and relieving breast engorgement all of these are important uh, to ensure that uh, breast milk and storage is a good form now uh, moving forward it's important to ensure that before uh, expressing the breast milk good hand wash and good hygiene techniques are maintained and electrical breast pumps and are better tolerated than mechanical pumps or much better than manual expression also the collecting kits uh, should be rinsed clean with so soap and uh, hot water air dried after every use and clean capped glass and are used and stored in plastic containers and special freezing bags we know that uh, breast milk can be stored at a room temperature of almost 6 uh, hours uh, for 6 hours rather and can be refrigerated in a simple refrigerator up to 24 to 48 hours and in commercial freezers for 3 to 6 months pasteurization of breast milk doesn't affect the fatty acid composition and sterilization results in a 13% loss of fat heating or microwaving is not recommended because there is a loss of the anti infective factor such as secretory iga and thawed milk must be used within 24 hours now i would like to add that the first uh, milk bank rather in india has turned 30 years last year so the first milk bank was uh, opened in sion hospital in mumbai and in 2019 it completed 30 years of fully functional operation and the milk bank ensures that breast milk is available for many babies who require it now with that i come to the end of this presentation uh, Uh, we have seen in this presentation the anatomy physiology of breastfeeding the factors which help in favoring breastfeeding the factors which should be promoted the baby friendly hospital initiative steps the positions of breastfeeding benefits of feeding to the baby and to the mother the difficulties and challenges which are faced by breastfeeding mothers as well as uh, certain new advances such as the milk bank uh, before concluding the presentation i would like to highlight the two key takeaways which i began the presentation with the best gift for a baby is breast milk and secondly 6 months of exclusive breastfeeding is a must for any baby and it is uh, i can only reiterate this time and again that breast milk is the best gift which can be given to a baby i thank the Inter indian academy of pediatrician unicef waba uh, breastfeeding promotion network of india for all the good work which goes on in uh, promoting breastfeeding Uh, to all of you who have listened to this talk i request you to take this message forward and spread the awareness to as many people as possible to ensure maximum breastfeeding is established and uh, uh, i hope this presentation did clear many doubts if at all you had it to a student perspective i hope it uh, ensured that the fundamentals are laid clear and to a general public i hope that it has laid a few uh, concepts clear as far as awareness is concerned and feeding technique is concerned uh, If you are a expectant mother or a lactating mother and have any further questions uh, please do contact your obstetrician or your pediatrician to clear these doubts because the sooner you do clear it the better on that note i thank you for listening and uh, hope you tune into the next video thank you